Okay. Well, I am very glad indeed to be here in, in Victoria, and I am impressed by the hospitality that I've been hospitality, excuse me, that I've been shown. I'm even more impressed, I must say, with the extraordinary things that are taking place here. From from a New York City, Manhattan perspective, you come down to Victoria, and it's nice to see the exciting things that are taking place. You folks are going places uh, at UHV, uh, Cornavaca among them, but uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of extraordinary things are happening. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm pleased to see that kind of excitement taking place. Um, yeah, I am talking about uh, Donald Barthelme today. My uh, subject, my my the, the title, if you will, of what I'm going to sort of semi-read and semi-talk to you is finding a place where everything is different. That notion that uh, Donald Barthelme and probably many of you in this audience, I guess I'm, I'm speaking especially to the students uh, in the audience here, looking, constantly looking, desiring, hoping to find a place that's different from the place that you have now, not necessarily where you live, but in the kinds of possibilities that exist for you, the kinds of things that you'll be able to do. For Barthelme, it was in writing. For you, it might be something else. But uh, some of the things that I have to say here, I suppose, are going to be um, familiar to you, uh, whether you're writers or not. Sometime in the late 60s, when I was in my 20s, I started reading the stories of Donald Barthelme. Like most students around me then, I was in search of a writer who could talk to me, talk to me about my time in a language that seemed to be something resembling my own language, someone who knew what it meant to experience the world that I lived in. The great underground and experimental writers of the 1950s and early 60s, writers like Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, Ken Kesey, for instance, seemed to me at that time already a little dated, a little stuck in a time when things were tight, when experiment was a kind of heroic gesture, a fist in the face of good American parents everywhere. If you were going to shake things up in the late 60s, 50s and 60s, you needed to shout. By the late 60s, though, shouting had become a way of life. Writers couldn't outshout Hendrix and Joplin, and anyway, Hendrix and Joplin did it louder and better. So the writers, it seemed to me, had fallen behind somehow. Discovering a writer who struck you as being cool enough to talk to you about your own experience could be a lonely pursuit, shared, if you were lucky, by a few charmed friends, or maybe by a book reviewer or two, maybe from ABR, who almost always lived far away, where the life you dreamed about was going on, where everything was quite clearly entirely different. My own pursuit led me to Donald Barthelme, then a youngish writer whose work was appearing frequently in The New Yorker, and who had by that time published a couple of books with fascinating and compelling titles, Come Back, Dr. Caligari, and the best of them, Unspeakable Practices, Unnatural Acts. It's hard for me to recall exactly what it was that intrigued me about Donald Barthelme's work when I first read it back then, other than those knockout titles. But almost certainly a couple of things that I liked was that he was clearly whip smart, he was clearly funny, and he was ironic. Now Americans are suspicious of irony. We often don't like it. It's mean. It's cynical. It's not very democratic. Our ideology tends to be sunnier and more optimistic, a little like the worldview of the classic American musical, everything's coming up roses. Something's coming, something great. Dream the impossible dream. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you, tomorrow. <laughs> but in a world full of shouting and turmoil, as the late 60s certainly was, irony seemed to me a far, more use, far more usable than blind optimism to protect yourself from the things that haunted you, to attack the things that you hated. It seemed the last and best defense against feelings of helplessness, confusion, anger, and sadness. So we listened to Dylan, looked at Warhol, saw movies by Godard, and some of us at least read Donald Barthelme. There were perhaps a few other writers doing somewhat similar things, Thomas Pynchon perhaps, Kurt Vonnegut once in a while, 
Joseph Heller once. But both of me was my man. He was as furious as they were, but he was, to my eye, the coolest of the cool. I'm going to read you now a couple of bits of Bartholomew, just in case, well, it might be useful for you to, to hear something if you haven't yet been introduced. Hopefully, I'll be able to give you some sense of what I mean by whip smart, funny, and ironic. This first is a short bit from a story called Critique de la Vie Quotidienne, The Daily Life, Critique of the Daily Life. This is Bartholomew now. I remember once we were sleeping in a narrow bed, Wanda and I, in a hotel on a holiday, and the child crept into bed with us. If you insist on overburdening the bed, we said, you must sleep at the bottom with the feet. But I don't want to sleep with the feet, the child said. Sleep with the feet, we said. They won't hurt you. The feet kick, the child said, in the middle of the night. The feet are the floor, we said. Take your choice. Why can't I sleep with the heads, the child said, like everybody else. Because you are a child, we said. And the child subsided, whimpering, the final arguments in the case having been presented and the verdict in. But in truth, the child was not without recourse. It urinated in the bed, <laughs> in the vicinity of the feet. God damn it, I said, inventing this formulation in the instant of need. What the devil is happening at the bottom of the bed? I couldn't help it, the child said. It just came out. I forgot to bring the plastic sheet, Wanda said. Holy hell, I said. Is there no end to this family life? And here's one more. The beginning of the story in a similar vein called Chablis. My wife wants a dog. She already has a baby. The baby's almost two. My wife says that the baby wants the dog. <laughs> My wife has been wanting a dog for a long time. I've had to be the one to tell her that she couldn't have it. But now the baby wants the dog, my wife says. This may be true. The baby is very close to my wife. They go around together all the time, clutching each other tightly. I ask the baby, who is a girl, whose girl are you? Are you daddy's girl? The baby says, mama, mama, mama. I don't see why I should buy a $100 dog for that damn baby. <laughs> Both of me looked with a calm but ironic eye upon the ligaments of, middle, of the American middle class. Marriage, parenthood, domestic life, love life, keeping up with the Joneses, drinks before dinner. And as these two bits suggest, so much for the middle class, so beloved by American top politicians, so much for this family life. And he was able to do quite a, t a job, too, on those great monumental figures of Western culture. Shakespeare, Beethoven, Tolstoy, Bach, Goethe, with whom we were in the process of acquainting ourselves in those first years of college. We wanted to hate them all, old dead guys who didn't have a thing to say to people who watched TV, ate frozen dinners, looked at paintings by Warhol and Oldenburg, worried about Vietnam, and listened to Sergeant Pepper for 18 hours straight. <laughs> but Bartholomew made them confounded, conflicted, and contrary. He made them human and silly, just like us. Here's the opening paragraph from Conversations with Goethe. I was walking home from the theater with Goethe this evening when we saw a small boy in a plum-colored waistcoat. Youth, Goethe said, is the silky apple butter on the good brown bread, bread of possibility. <laughs> Here's Bartholomew again with his take on Da Vinci and the Mona Lisa speaking in his scholarly voice in a piece called Natural History. The original canvas of La Gioconda, the Mona Lisa, showed, according to Casola, 
an octopus hurriedly departing the picture plane on the right side. <laughs> During the Frisbean Wars, the octopus was, e was either scraped off or fell off. <laughs> Winkelmann asserts that the octopus in Leonardo's iconography represents either virility or uncollectible debts. <laughs> in either case, the animal was clearly not trustworthy. But that wasn't all. Taking on the big dogs of Western culture and knowing enough about the big dogs to take them on was terrific. But Bartholomew also seemed to know about everything we knew about. The movies, the TV shows, the comics, the music, the clothes, the art, the slang. Whatever. He was, as someone said at the time, on the leading edge of the trash phenomenon. As good citizens of the 60s, we knew much of what we loved was trash but it was quality trash. It was part of the texture of our lives, and we cared about it. And so it seemed did he. He could mix together the profound bits and the silly bits. Kafka and King Kong. Kierkegaard, Goethe, and George Washington, alongside Batman, the Phantom of the Opera, Captain Blood, and Waylon Jennings. And by doing this, he was allowing them in, allowing them to take their decent place in our worldview. Here's the opening paragraph of the party. I went to a party and corrected a pronunciation. The man whose voice I had adjusted fell back into the kitchen. But you, you had wandered off into another room, testing the effect on members of the audience of your ruffled blouse, your long magenta skirt. Giant hands, black, thick with fur, reaching in through the windows. Yes, it was King Kong, back in action. And all of the guests uttered loud and aloud exclamations of fatigue and disgust, examining the situation in the light of their own needs and emotions, hoping the ape was real or paper mache according to their temperaments, or wondering whether other excitements were possible out in the crisp white night. The sprightly introduction of King Kong into an overly urbane group of vain and worn out middle class party goers, so conscious of themselves and their social faux pas that even the great ape clamoring up the walls and beating on the windows can't disturb their self absorption. What kind of world is it, we certainly thought, that can't take King Kong seriously? Even if, in this story, Kong, having grown a little older, is now an adjunct professor of art history at Rutgers, <laughs> who tells us human experience is different in some ways from ape experience, but that doesn't mean I don't like perfumed nights, too. <laughs> Martha me then was a kind of arbiter, keeping score of the things it might be worth paying attention to. And if everywhere he looked, he saw human folly, that was because human folly was pretty much all there was to see. I continued to read Bartholomew, of course, long after my college years. And when I took a job as professor at the University of Southern Mississippi, I had the pleasure, as has already been mentioned, of working with his two younger brothers, Frederick and Stephen. And then sometime after Donald Bartholomew died, unexpectedly, unexpectedly in 1989, it was his brother, Frederick, who asked me if I would put together some books containing Donald's unpublished and uncollected writing. The first of those three edited volumes, The Teachings of Don B., came out in 1993. And the other two books were essentially completed by 1995. But owing to the vagaries of the trade publishing business, the knowledge of which would make Rupert Murdoch blush, the second book, entitled Not Knowing, did not make it out until 1997. And the third, Flying to America, finally came out of hiding last year after no fewer than 16 years in the making. Now, after all these years of working closely on Donald Bartholomew, getting to know something about his life, thinking about him in the context of American fiction of the past 50 years or so, I still find the things which first excited me about him are the things that still excite me. But they are not, perhaps, the most interesting things about him. For instance, that all over irony, which once seemed to set him apart, is now pretty much everywhere. Anybody who's read Dave Eggers or George Saunders 
knows that irony is alive and well in current American fiction. Anybody who's been watching Stephen Colbert or The Office over the past few years is watching a pretty good species of irony. Anybody who's gone to movies by the Coen brothers or Wes Anderson is looking at an even defter irony. And indie rock has the irony almost danceable. But the two things I want to talk about now are things I certainly didn't think much about when I first started reading him. The first of them, that Bartholomew is a Texas writer, is perhaps only interesting and important to people around these parts. But the second, the way Bartholomew struggled to liberate fiction from tradition and find a place where everything was different, now strikes me as being crucial to understanding what Bartholomew is all about. So first things first. I simply want to declare, here and now, that Donald Barthelme is probably the best Texas writer who ever was. His Texas credentials are perfectly in order, despite the time he spent as an expatriate in New York City. <laughs> Though he was born in Philadelphia, and I hope that you won't hold that against him, his father was a Texan, and Don's family moved back here when he was two. He lived in Houston until he was 30, when he went up to New York City and attended the University of Houston, interrupted his schooling to become a full-fledged staffer for the Houston Post by the age of 20, wrote hundreds of movie and theater reviews for the paper while he worked there. Then, after being shipped out to Korea, he came back to Houston, where he was twice married, worked in the public relations department at the university, where he wrote, as he once said, poppycock for the president, sometimes cocky pap. <laughs> While doing that, he also founded the Houston Forum, the university's first literary journal, and at the age of 28, the age of 28 became the director of Houston's Contemporary Arts Museum, which under his directorship brought in some of the country's most celebrated artists, writers, and critics to Houston for the first and sometimes the only time. Now this is really not bad for an opening gambit. Uh, and uh, indeed, Bartholomew could have, I suppose, been thought of by the Houston Chamber of Commerce as a kind of dreamboat of some kind. Now, I have to admit that Bartholomew did leave Houston for New York in 1961. I'm sorry to have to tell you this. And that it is New York and not Texas that dominates the landscape of his work. But his Texas roots are always showing through, and things and places Texan constantly appear in his writing. For instance, in I Bought a Little City, the little city is Galveston. City of Churches is very Houstonian. And cowboys, Willie and Waylon, Tex-Mex food, barbecue, and other Texas goodies appear just everywhere. In any case, his, perhaps his New York interregnum can be entirely forgiven when I tell you, as Charlie already has, that he returned to Houston for good in the early 80s, became the head of the creating writing, creative writing program at the University of Houston, and very quickly turned it into one of the best in the country. By all rights, Donald Bartholomew should still be with us. And if he were, he would very probably still be in Houston and still wearing the cowboy boots he wore while he lived in Greenwich Village. So if you're desperately searching for ways to be proud of Texas's literary heritage, the way, for instance, Mississippi is proud of its heritage, you would do far, far worse and to start with Donald Barthelme. Now, the second item on my agenda is to talk about how finding a place where everything is different was a major drive, a crucial motivating force in Barthelme's writing. And that is a more complicated thing to talk about. One of the reasons it's complicated is because his compulsion to make a kind of art that had never existed before is a compulsion he shares with many, perhaps even most, writers and artists. The real job is to differentiate Bartholomew from all the others who've had the same desire. But I'm going to have time here only to mention a few of those differentiations and leave the real discussion to those hundreds of critics who will be writing books and teaching courses on the subject in semesters to come. So mainly, I want to talk about a bit about some of the obstacles he found in his path many of which were probably not so far different from those faced by any of us, any of us, that is, who want somehow to find a place for ourselves, 
a new place and a new voice, different from the one we've had handed to us. It is, I assume and I hope, a desire that animates many of you now. The very first story in Donald Barthelme's very first book was Florence Green is 81. In it, a group of writers and artists are at a dinner trying to convince Florence Green, who has $300 million, to fund some of their projects. But Florence Green is 81 and mainly sleeps through the meal. Once in a while, she wakes up briefly and announces the only thing she's really interested in. I want to go somewhere where everything is different. This is, the narrator of the story, the narrator of the story goes on to say, a simple, perfect idea. The old babe demands nothing less than total otherness. It seems appropriate and telling that Barthelme's title character in the first story in his first book has only one thing left that she really actually still wants, to go somewhere where everything is different. It is appropriate and telling because for Barthelme to try to go to such a place in his life, yes, but mostly in his writing, seems to have been a driving force practically from the moment he became aware of who he was and what he wanted for himself. To want this total otherness is indeed a simple, perfect idea, but like most simple, perfect ideas, it is immensely difficult to achieve. There is the problem of having some talent and imagination, of course, but even if you have those things, as Barthelme certainly did, other obstacles rise up to block your path. There is the pull of what has come before, the power of the tradition. There is the problem of setting the bar so high that you fear you can never fulfill your own expectations or the expectations of others. There is the inevitable puzzlement and sometimes outright opposition which gathers if you do succeed. There is the problem of what to do when something new is finally achieved, if it is ever achieved. After all, as soon as the writer achieves the new, something entirely different, what's next? The new new, the post new, the new newness? It isn't easy. Early in the 20th century, Ezra Pound was demanding that it was precisely the right artist's job to make it new. We can't now ask Pound how easy that was, but if we could, old Ez would no doubt have said, had some things to say. Not easy, he would have told you. Thinking perhaps of how many American colleges he had to get kicked out of, how many patrons with money he had to charm and harangue in order to make publication of new work even possible, how many slashes and cuts he made to the wasteland in order to help his friend T.S. Eliot get to something truly new. James Joyce as well would think perhaps about the years he tried to get Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man published at a time when something as new and different as that novel would be looked upon with suspicion and hatred. And the typesetters, the people who put the type into the press and ran the sheets, could and did simply refuse to set the type for what they thought was such an immoral and despicable book. Or how Samuel Beckett, who spent years working with Joyce, how easy would it be to go to a place where everything is different when Joyce himself must have seemed to have been to every new place before Beckett could get there. <laughs> so now let's imagine Donald Barthelme as a young man, living in Houston, a much more conservative and provincial city in the 1940s and 50s than it is now, a city where what was happening in the new art, the new music, and the new writing was not exactly on everyone's lips. But there he was, a young man who at an early age had decided he wanted to be a writer and who had decided at a very early age not to be a cowboy. Let's imagine Barthelme in the mid-1950s, reading Beckett's Waiting for Godot for the first time and finding there a model for what he wanted to do in his own work, irony and distance and a way of handling his recognition that the world is very often immersed in misery. Perhaps he thought, what now? What can I do? Beckett's gone, gone to a place I might have gone, but he beat me there. How do I get around this giant? How do I get around this achievement? For Barthelme, Beckett was the most powerful of the great literary fathers whom he loved 
but could not allow himself simply to imitate. In his writing, Bartholomew had a lot to say about those dead fathers, the ones who would make it so difficult for him to be entirely independent, to achieve the total otherness that Florence Green had wanted. He says a good deal about this problem in a novel published about midway through his writing, writing life called, of course, The Dead Father. It's his best novel, and I would say one of the great novels of the past 50 years in American literature. And in it, his hackles are pointing straight up. I will read here a short excerpt from a section of that novel called A Manual for Sons, in which we are told of some of the difficulties of dealing with fathers. Fathers are like blocks of marble, giant cubes, highly polished, with veins and seams placed squarely in your path. They block your path. They cannot be climbed over, neither can they be slithered past. They are the past. If you attempt to go around one, you'll find that another, winking at the first, has mysteriously appeared athwart the trail. Or maybe it is the same one moving with the speed of paternity. <laughs> of all possible fathers, the fanged father is the least desirable. If you can get your lariat around one of those fangs and quickly wrap the other end of it several times around one of the fangs and quickly wrap the other end several times around your saddle horn and if your horse is a trained roping horse and knows what to do, how to plant his front feet and then back up with small nervous steps, keeping the lariat taut, then maybe you have a chance. For Bartholomew, dead fathers, especially the great dead fathers of the literary tradition, were ever present, practically impossible to tame, always cajoling, threatening, challenging, criticizing, closing off opportunities and possibilities, bullying, comparing, dismissing. Bartholomew's own father, his real father, was an architect and a very accomplished one. But he was a modernist architect at a time in Houston, and almost everywhere else in the United States for that matter, when modern architecture was looked upon with suspicion, confusion, and sometimes horror. Bartholomew's, Bartholomew's father's own dead fathers, his major influences, weren't even dead yet. They were the great modernist architects, Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, and the Bauhaus School, and he believed in them and their vision with the intensity of the fully converted. I was exposed early, Bartholomew once said, to an almost religious crusade. Around 1940, Donald Bartholomew was about nine at the time. His father built a modernist house in West Oaks in Houston one of the first, if not the first in Houston, and furnished it with furniture by the great modernist designers, Alto, Saarinen, Eames, and others. The Bartholomew House would hardly cause a second look these days. After all, every airport in the country now has furniture based on the designs of Alto and Eames, and great modern architects have now taken their decent place in the dusty shelf of old masters. But in those days, the Bartholomew House was so novel, so new, that Houstonians out driving on a weekend afternoon would quite literally stop and park along the street to stare at it. The entire Bartholomew family would sometimes greet the gawkers by going outside, forming a chorus line, dancing across the lawn, high kicking all the way. It is not hard to see from this that Donald Bartholomew, at a very young age, was being taught something about the adventure of the new, and perhaps even one of the ways resistance to the new might be contested with humor, with irony, with vigor, and with high kicks, if necessary. From the first, then, Bartholomew was aware of the importance of creating new forms, and aware, too, of something of the difficulty. He'd come by this knowledge honestly. As a character in one of his early stories explains, my childhood was pastoral and energetic and rich in experiences which developed my character. In this kind of world, absurd of you will, possibilities proliferate and escalate all around us and there are opportunities for beginning again. One way Bartholomew began again was to quite literally start a new life 
outside of Houston, far from what he knew, in a place where everything was new. In late 1961, he left Houston for New York City. New York was then a city where all things were said and done, especially all the new things that were being said and done. These days, now, and I can confirm this from living there for a little while, is New York is no longer the place where all excitement and innovation begins and ends. But in 1961, it was as close to the center of things as you could get. If you wanted to immerse yourself in the new experimental writing, theater, film, whatever was happening in art, if you wanted to listen to jazz live and not just on record, if you wanted to be around the center of creative energy and meet the people who are generating that energy, New York was the place for you. And it was in New York, uh, while in New York, I should say, Bartholomew continued to employ comic irony, but he also figured out a different way of doing it. He figured out how, figured out how to make it new. The new in Bartholomew's work, his undiscovered country, shows itself whenever he locates just the right brown nut-like word in just the right place. By refusing to lapse into tired language and exhausted literary forms, whenever he constructs another inspired juxtaposition, the cunning method of the collagist, revising, changing, recombining, and intercutting the bits and pieces of a tired tradition to create an entirely new world from the refreshed fragments of the old. The new place that Bartholomew made for fiction is a world of stories which not only use, but feature surprising constructs of language. Stories which have no, love, uh, no uh, lovely arc, uh, lovely, I should say, a lovely and predictable arc, uh, but instead are all middles, more like a painting by Jackson Pollock or a poem by John Ashbery than the highly plotted but sometimes plodding stories that constantly keep us reading by telling us, and then, and then, and then. His stories dispute the reality of realism. In reality, lives don't have that lovely arc and turn out more often to be muddled and fragmented than structured. And also, unlike realist fiction, his stories don't feature narrators who tell us what we are to think. We must confront a Bartholomew story the way we confront experience itself, with very little help from an ever-present narrator guide who directs our attentions and establishes our judgment of things. It's what Thomas Pinchon has called Bartholmismo, the clarity and sweep, the intensity of emotion, the transcendent weirdness of primary experience. His formal inventiveness, then, has a great deal to do with what, uh, what made what he wrote new, someplace different. But of all the qualities of his work, perhaps the one that I find most affecting is his ability to make irony almost genial, yet somehow without losing any of its sting. Bartholomew once wrote, the world is sagging, snagging, scaling, spalling, pilling, pinging, pitting, warping, checking, fading, chipping, cracking, yellowing, leaking, staling, shrinking. Such a world does not allow for much illusion, and it's not a world about which we can say, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you, tomorrow. But Bartholomew also knows the world, new or old, is never satisfactory or ever going to be. Like most writers, Bartholomew is against all the dumb things that are going on, but his opposition is always kind. He's more aware than most, it seems to me, that human frailty is an unavoidable feature of the human condition. He is not a great hater. Instead, he treats our follies with a kind of bemused, melancholy affection. His worldview is, if you will, comic, not tragic. Even though Bartholomew does sometimes seem to give the impression of his seeing our flounderings as from a great height, an enormous distance, he is never disconnected. Never, never does he refuse the world. Art, he once said, thinks ever of the world, cannot not think of the world, could not turn its back on the world even if it wished to. Hating the world is not, Bartholomew clearly thought, an adequate response to the world. Donald Bartholomew's work did indeed establish a place where everything was different. It was not an easy job. Making something new is never an easy job. 
You must go about it with dedication, vision, and furious enthusiasm. But in creating this new room in the house of fiction, Bartholomew also showed us one of the things art can do, for him perhaps the most important thing art can do, it can make something where before there was nothing, or at least nothing satisfactory, nothing that wasn't running down, nothing that hadn't been defeated by its own limitations. A friend and editor of Bartholomew's once told me, in the 1960s, when everything seemed to be falling apart, I always thought that as long as Dawn was alive and writing, everything would be all right. And even now, though Bartholomew is, alas, no longer alive and writing, what he left us still manages to rearrange our perplexities in such a way as to give relief, to refresh our sorry selves, even in the midst of confusion and flailing, laughing as we go. Thank you very much. Time for a little uh, some question and answer if you're so inclined. Uh, if you guys have classes to attend, you can, uh, excuse yourself, of course, but uh, please uh, help yourself. Question for Dr. Herbert. Which one of his books were your favorite? Well, uh, he collected uh, a number of his best stories in a companion volume called 60 Stories. Uh, I would say that if you were going to start reading Bartholomew, and I, it seems to be that. Um, most of his best, many of his best stories, let's put it that way, are collected in that book, 60 Stories. So I guess I would say that. Of his novels, I would say, as I think I've already said, The Dead Father, I think, is his best novel. Uh, though I'm sure many of you who have read Bartholomew would perhaps prefer uh, Snow White, maybe even Paradise, which is his, probably his most accessible novel. So I'd go with 60 Stories on this. And The Dead Father for novels. Mm-hmm. Right. Personally, it's so easy for me to fall into a kind of Bartholomew irony. Too easy for me, and it is indeed something that. As a writer, and I'm certainly not in the kind of class that Donald Bartholomew is, but as a writer, it was so easy for me to do that that uh, I was aware of it at all times and I tried, sort of tried to resist it in, in some sort of way. Uh, when, you, when you have that kind of powerful pull on you, uh, you do have to find another way. And sometimes that's part of the great adventure because there are opportunities that are closed off to you not because anyone has really closed them off, because that you realize that you cannot simply imitate a writer that you love. You have to struggle to find something new. And in that struggle, you find a different sort of voice and are able to do something that is yours, your voice. So the answer to your question is, yeah. Uh, even in my relatively short fiction writing career, uh, yeah, uh, Donald, Donald Bartholomew, and he's not the only one. They're all of them. All the dead fathers, all the great dead who are lined up against me, I tell you. <laughs> you know, for, for, many, uh, for many people, especially it seems to me, uh, student writers, there are a couple of uh, writers who always seem to appear. Hemingway is one of them. Everybody has a period, everybody who wants to write has a period where they want to write a little like Hemingway. Get the Hemingway thing done. Beckett, for, for, for Donald Bartholomew certainly, and for some of you probably now, um, and there will be writers, you know, coming along. Some of you are, are writing, maybe you want to write like uh, David Foster Wallace, but he's already done it. You know, so what are you going to do? Uh, it, it, it continues to be, you know, the power, the pull of tradition, and the way that that creates an obstacle in finding your own voice is, is always going to be there. Yes? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I'm not quite sure I'm following you. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what the influence of Watson is. That if you, if you, if you, uh, if you unknowingly just read back at the choice, um, and then you, you read, um, then you read Watson, and you get, into, you, you know, you pick up on the irony, mm -hmm. it comes alive. And you go back and you read the classic, you know, the dead classic. Um, what's the influence? What's the influence of Bartholomew? Uh, what, how does that? How does that influence continue? Well, you know, th this is one of the great things. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer your question adequately, but one of the great things about reading a contemporary of yours is that contemporary will inevitably lead you back to the great figures who came before him. Reading Barthelme will le will lead you back to reading Kafka. Will lead you back to reading Joyce. Will lead, read you certainly lead you to back at it first, perhaps, but read, lead you back, read you to Kafka, to Joyce, finally back into the 19th century, into the 18th century. You'll be reading Tristram Shandy. You'll be reading Kleist. You'll be reading all of those books with a new eye, a new pair of spectacles somehow that enliven all of those writers who you may have before read and dismissed as being too old, too dusty, not for me. But somehow reading a contemporary will. Uh, will, will lead you in those kinds of new directions. I suppose for some of you reading writers like, who I hope you're reading, writers like, say, Dave Eggers, George Saunders, two people I've met who clearly have been influenced, it seems to me, by Bartholomew. Reading those two might re lead you back to Bartholomew, who and then will lead you back to Kafka and Beckett, and who uh, in turn will lead you back to Joyce, and so on, all the way back to Tristram Shandy, all the way back to the Arabian Nights. So. I mean, that, that kind of setup, I think, always existed uh, or exists. For me, you know, I, I insist that Bartholomew did do something new with his irony, something different than the other people had done. And that kind of genial irony, that insistent use of collage, now he was not alone in doing that, and certainly he was beaten to it by plenty of painters. Uh, but it is, you know, uh, Bartholomew once said, about collage as a technique. He was once asked, what is the major tool of artists in our century? And his answer was rubber cement. <laughs> that cutting and pasting of things. Now we don't have to use rubber cement. We've got computers for that. But uh, the idea still holds on, the notion of finding bits and pieces. Well, that, Bartholomew's use of that in a particularly literary way, I think, is, for me, uh, one of the most powerful poles of his influence on contemporary writers, and will continue to be. And if they're going to use collage techniques, they're going to just have to do it in a slightly different way than he did. It's no use loving Kurt Schwitters or, uh, or somebody, a, a famous uh, collage painter, and uh, going to your own canvas and just creating another Schwitters. You better do something, something for yourself. Thank you. Thank now you. get to class. Yeah. Thanks again for coming, and uh, please join us again on Thursday, September 11th for Ruben Martinez.